Welcome to the first uh, grand rounds of this next academic year. Dr. Chansky sends his apologies. He's on call and is stuck in the operating room, so he uh, doing an emergent case from call. So um, I'm going to be filling in for uh, getting us going today. So welcome to everybody and welcome to all the folks watching over at uh, the VA and at Harborview and online, wherever you may be. Um, we'll get to our program in a minute, but to continue the tradition of these uh, grand rounds, kudos. I need have a few emails. I'm just going to read out first. Uh, congratulations to Eric Magnuson, one of our R3s. Eric was awarded Consultant of the Year by the Emergency Department from all the residents, so not just in orthopedics. So congratulations on that. We have another one from uh, Neil for Neil. Tarabadkar, uh, Dr. Neil came in to evaluate me. He was kind, he listened and educated me. He is a very good doctor. Uh, also, I guess he was working with Dr. Kwan at that time, and the email goes on to say Dr. Kwan came in very kind and very personable. We have another uh, call out from uh, Children's uh, for Dr. Colin Kennedy. Uh, many thanks to Dr. Colin Kennedy and Brenda Ang for their speedy response and care today, and a final Kudos for Dr. Calvin Schlepp and Matt Barron from the Spine team when a uh, Harborview hospitalist commented that um, Matt and Calvin have been excellent to work with. They're very professional, great to work with, and Matt is especially very thoughtful. So just a few of the calls. I know everybody does a lot of great work, but these are just some of the emails that came in. So I'd like to continue and thank our, our, our speakers for Grand Rounds today. We're going to learn about occupational hazards of the orthopedic surgeon. We have Chris Domes, who's going to be leading us off. Well, he'll introduce the rest of the program. And thank you to our visiting speakers as well. Thanks, everybody, uh, for coming today. As Dr. Tatesman said, we'll be talking about occupational hazards. Very interesting topic for us in the rest of our careers as residents and also uh, practicing physicians in orthopedics. An overview, we're going to do an introduction. Uh, go over a little survey, so it's OK to have your phones out during that portion of the uh, presentation. And then I will be going over no, noise-induced hearing loss and pregnancy in orthopedics. And then we have Dr. Michael Richardson from the Department of Radiology as well as orthopedics. Um, and uh, going over radiation exposure and Dr. John Lynch from the Department of Infectious Disease going over blood-borne pathogens. So as a little introduction, occupational hazards are any condition of a job that can result in illness or injury. There are several governing bodies that we interact with. OSHA is the main overall um, U.S. Uh, governmental agency. There are state departments, such as the Washington State of, of uh, Labor and Industry, and then NIOSH, which is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And this is a uh, division of the CDC that is primarily research focused in occupational health. So in looking at what the CDC has put out, in looking at hospital uh, associated injuries and occupational hazards, um, in 2011, this is the most recent data we have, and it was published in 2013, about 59,000 work-related injuries were reported that resulted in lost work. Um, every year, there's about 400,000 needle sticks, 25% of which occur uh, in the operating room and with surgeons. Overall, there's very poor physician data and reporting. Um, most of this is thought to do because uh, the data that we get is from hospitals uh, directly and physicians work either independently through hospitals, um, as most surgeons do in private practice, and so there's less overall physician-specific uh, information. When you look at the data that was collected from and put forth by the, uh, the kind of the CDC and NIOSH, um, in 2011, the primarily groups of people that had these occupational hazards were our nursing aides um, and attendants, and then EM, EMTs, occupational therapy, uh, therapists, as well as assistants. And if you look at the types of injuries that they sustained, a vast majority of them are overexertion and bodily reaction, so overuse type injuries, followed by slips, trips, and falls, um, and then a spattering of things after that. So, In a uh, paper uh, out of uh, Saudi Arabia, there's some, uh, a reasonably good kind of breakdown about the hazards that the surgeon face. These, they broke these down, and I'll just go over them briefly, but accidental hazards such as stabs, burns, electric shocks, hearing loss, physical hazards, these include radiation, laser, ionized gas, musculoskeletal pain, chemical hazards, inhaled anesthetics, irritants from latex, chloroprep, any of those things that we put on patients. And then also there's the biological hazards that surgeons face, such as disease transmission. This also includes inhalation, such as from bovies. 
So now we're going to go to the polling section. So take out your phones. Go ahead. This is how many times in the last year have you had a needle stick event? So you, you put in the number and text the letter. Yeah, text the number. No, text the letter. Very interesting. <clears throat> so, quite a few. I mean, more than 50%. I mean, okay. We'll move on, but you can see the trend. Needle sticks are common. I don't know if. Here's another one. So, we're switching it. Did you report the needle stick to employee health? This might be. Coming in from our last one, but <coughs> okay. Well, we might have had some crossover from the last one, so we'll stop voting now. But um, <clears throat> interesting, uh, you know, there is maybe some cultural things that we need to change there if, if people aren't reporting these needle sticks. Next, we're going to go to lead. What configuration of lead do you use? Full apron, shield, full apron, skirt plus thyroid. Other is choose your own adventure. Good, good to see. At least thyroid shields are prevalent. Okay. We'll stop voting. And the last question is, uh, do you use leaded glasses? <clears throat> In the operating room, preference that. Okay, we'll stop there, but a vast majority say no. So, um, this is very interesting. I'm going to now move on to some of the other topics. So, we're going to talk about noise induced hearing loss. So, that's any hearing loss attributed to excessively loud noise. Pretty straightforward. Um, it, the <coughs> recommended exposure has been set by NIOSH, that Center uh, for Disease Control kind of subsidiary. And it's the occupational noise exposed uh, during its set at uh, a time-weighted average of eight hours at the highest level being 85. So it's based on a uh, formula. Uh, it's very important to remember that uh, decibel system is a logarithmic scale. So in this, you can see at 85 decibels, you can hit your, uh, you know, hit your maximal allotted amount at eight hours. If you go to 100 decibels, 15 minutes. If you go to 120 decibels, nine seconds. Very important to remember that. Some of the most common things, so normal conversation is about 55 to 60 uh, vacuums, um, 65 to 80 jet engines, 140. Dr. Bragi's, you know, OR is probably in there around 120 with the music. Um, hearing protection is recommended above 85. Some of the common uh, Construction site, so jackhammer, uh, 96. Masonry saw, 95, so higher levels. Pile driver, not the move, uh, 112. So, Specific to operating rooms, though, um, of this uh, paper by Zervden in uh, 2008, they looked at saws, drills, K-wires, and hammers and saw the average noise level. So there are 
some impulse levels above this, but it saw at 95. So if you look at the 85, um, how long it takes to exceed your, your allotted quotient at the 85 decibels, looking at approximately 45 minutes there with the saw, longer at uh, 2.3 hours with the drill, KOR driver even longer and a hammer even longer. Their conclusions, um, have hearing protection available, change from pneumatic, because the pneumatic uh, drivers are louder than the battery operated drivers, limit exposure to yourself, as well as people around you, and then hearing test for employees. Further, if you look specifically at the data for arthroplasty, uh, a paper uh, out of New Zealand uh, showed the average uh, dose for 85 decibels um, per arthroplasty at 27% uh, for hips and for knees. Uh, one arthroplasty is about 41% of your average uh, dose. The authors also do a good job of distilling down some other um, Drills such as our AO drills, our uh, Hall 3M uh, maxi drivers, and even a plaster saw has a pretty significant <laughs> noise level. And so we need to be cognizant of that in our uh, clinics, our ORs, but also with our uh, cast techs. <clears throat> so really, what does this mean? So over a 40-year exposure, if you uh, get your 85 decibels, uh, eight hours, that carries a risk of 35% of hearing loss uh, for developing noise-induced hearing loss, 35%. And as since it is logarithmic, as you go to 90 decibels, that increases the incidence uh, above 50%. So it's very important. So it's really important to think about um, limiting your exposure in the operating room, limiting those around you in the operating room, uh, updating our equipment if we're able to do that, and then hearing tests. You need to think about that. It's hard to find uh, hearing protection in the ORs. However, most of the floors actually have uh, little um, the foam uh, hearing protectors. But that all comes into then how do you communicate with somebody in the operating room if you're yelling. And so it's, it's a very double-edged sword, but it is something that we need to be cognizant about and take steps if we can potentially do those to minimize our risks, especially over our long career. <clears throat> Next, I'm going to be going over uh, pregnancy in orthopedics and in the operating room. It's based off of a, a great uh, Yellow Journal article by Jessica Downs in 2014. So there's more females in orthopedics. And, but the exposure doesn't include just the orthopedic surgeons. It also includes our scrub techs, our, nurse, our nurses, our anesthesiologists, everybody. <clears throat> so going so over some of these exposures that are specific to pregnancy, anesthetic gases. Uh, there are unacceptable levels. Uh, nitrous oxide, 22 or 25 parts per million. Hal halothane, less than um, like 100 parts per million. Um, there are a few high quality studies looking at this. As you can imagine, you can't shove a bunch of humans who are pregnant and then turn on the gas and you know, follow the pregnancy later. Um, so most of this is based off of uh, toxology uh, studies with animals. There is an English study um, in the uh, 2000s where uh, anesthesiologists less than 40 years uh, old were compared to uh, age match controls and they found no difference in rates of spontaneous abortion infertility or cognitive abnormalities in these patients. Another thing that we're exposed to is methyl methacrylate. So that's uh, bone cement, and it gives off a metabolite that's toxic, and the, it's teratogenic as well as fetotoxic in mice. So in the um, OSHA, uh, a maximum amount you can have is 100 uh, parts per million uh, exposure over an eight-hour day. So max levels have been recorded of 280 parts per million in total hip arthroplasty. Um, vacuum mixing has been shown to cut that down, well, clearly, in, their, in one study to get an average of four parts per million versus hand mixing, 17 parts per million. Um, in one study in orthopedic surgeons who were exposed, uh, they found no levels of uh, MMA reported in breast milk or in serum uh, after uh, arthroplasty. Uh, in, in orthopedic surgeons doing it though. So the exposure tends to be, if you do have a reaction to it, happens in, uh, with uh, mucous membrane irritation. Um, so there's no great data that suggests that it uh, has caused uh, birth defects in people, but there is the potential based on the mice studies. And so that's why we think about it. That's why we're cognizant about it. And we like using the vacuum mixers. <clears throat> physical stress in pregnant women. So orthopedic operations are 20 to 30 percent of your aerobic capacity. This is well below the uh, mild to moderate rating that uh, women are given uh, for 30 minutes a day to, to exercise. Um, sorry we're not burning tons of calories while we're doing surgery. 
Um, but prolonged standing uh, has been shown to be associated with uh, early uh, birth and negative effects on interuterine growth. There is one more slide. Well, it's not in here, but I'll just go over the information. Um, the uh, other things that they found is that women who work over 100 hours had about a 10% risk of preterm labor and birth complications as compared to uh, women who worked under 100 hours and were pregnant. And then also uh, physicians who are um, pregnant had earlier uh, or higher rates of preterm labor as well as birth complications as compared to their male uh, partners uh, matched controls. So I think it's something that, you know, why these happen, things we think about are um, dehydration with long standing. Women also uh, have, can have issues with not pumping and having mastitis if they're operating for long periods of time. So I think uh, this is just a, a survey of the risk factors associated uh, with being pregnant and being a surgeon or being in the operating room, but it's something that we need to be cognizant about, especially as the, uh, uh, we get more and more women in orthopedics, which is always a good thing. So next I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Richardson, who will discuss uh, radiation exposure. Morning. Thanks for having me. There's a lot of causes of radiation. I'm going to stick to one x-rays, but if you want to know more about the other stuff, see me after class. The story starts back in 1895. William Conrad Rentgen discovers that he's fogging photographic plates and across his room in places that should be safe from light. Uh, he goes the extra mile and figures out there's some mysterious ray that's doing this. What he was doing is applying something like 40 to 70,000 volts to one of these Crooks tubes. Two weeks later, he'd experimented enough that he decided it was time to bring his wife in. And this is the uh, first known radiograph of a human, his wife. Uh, spouses can be sort of severe critics of one's work. So, uh, they're our greatest proponents and sometimes our greatest critics. Her response to this was, Wilhelm, you're a genius. You're going to win the Nobel Prize for this. No, it was OMG or Ach, mein Gott, I have seen my death. Now, things are moving pretty fast here. Uh, he discovered x rays on the 8th of November. He had it accepted for publication on the 28th of December. Peer review was much better in those days. And he was uh, all geared up to present this on the 23rd of January at the Big Society. Well, he leaked out to his friends hey, look at this cool stuff I've got here. And one of them leaked it out to the press, so the Vienna, Vienna Press, uh, they had a story about this and then cabled it to the rest of the world on January 6th. And suddenly, uh, this can only be called going viral in a long, long, long time before the internet. So here are the journals that actually hit. You can see Rentgen's own official announcement, but he was scooped by all of these other journals. February, uh, already somebody at Dartmouth was using it to look at a fractured ulna maybe the first orthopedic use of x-rays. So within a fairly short time, there are a lot of people all over the world uh, using gear like this, horrifying looking gear. Look at these wires going across the room like uh, carrying 40 to 70,000 volts. X-rays flying in every direction. You see the guy there with the, his hand over the little uh, intensifying screen, the x-ray beam is going right through his hand, right into his head, right into his eye. Nobody knows anything about shielding. One of the experimenters in the early days of x-rays was this guy, Thomas Edison, shown here looking through a fluoroscope he built. It's about 1896, not long after the discovery. Now, he thought it was cool, no doubt, to look at people's hands moving under the fluoroscope, but uh, where did he make his bones? Basically building the light bulb. So he thought, hmm, this might be a new fluorescent light bulb. So he checked it out. We'll come back to Edison in a minute. Now, here we are on March 6th, just four months after the discovery. Here's an x-ray of a frog in nature. And about two pages later, we're starting to see the first reports of, hmm, Edison says his eyes were really sore after several hours looking into the beam. Duh. Same page was reported by one of the first, world's first radiologists, Dr. Morton, said, blinding flash lights after I look in the beam for hours. Hmm, there's a lesson there. 
Let's go back to this slide now. Everybody looks at this and sees Thomas Edison. You should also see Clarence Daly in the back of the image right there. He was the assistant. He was the guy that put his hand under the beam for hours while Edison would look at his hand. He was also the guy that built thousands of these x-ray tubes. In those days, an x-ray tube was something you, you were a glass blower, you blew it yourself. There was no standardization. If you wanted to test these things, you tested the beam by putting your hand in it and turned the voltage up until you could see your bones. So, Clarence Daly did this thousands of times. He did it in his non-dominant hand until it started hurting. Switched to his other hand until it started hurting. Switched back and forth. Sadly, after doing this, it hurt too much to even work. And the pain got worse. He ended up having both arms amputated. And meanwhile, getting many lesions all over his head and face. Here's what Edison said. He was aghast. I have poisoned my assistant, Mr. Daly. Hair came out. His flesh began to ulcerate. Edison uh, manned up, and he took care of Daly for the rest of his uh, lamentably short life. He died at the age of 39 from metastatic CA, from skin cancer, of all things. It was just so massive, they could not control it. And then, of course, there's the practical side of it. Well, this probably won't be a very popular light bulb. So he actually decided these were too dangerous to mess with. He uh, took them out of his lab. Fortunately, other people didn't. And here we are about, uh, gosh, World War II, about 20 years later, we see trucks carrying these tubes across the battlefields. We see surgeons taking bullets out. Again, notice the lack of radiation equipment right here, radiation shielding. The beam is going right through the patient, right through the radiologist, or right through the surgeon's head, through that primitive viewing apparatus. Not everyone was so blasé, though. Here's an early x-ray tech looking like a man from Mars. We, even in radiology, we don't dress quite like this, but gosh, it's good that someone was respecting this. So what does a radiation burn look like? Well, uh, you can, if you want to go to the Wikipedia, you can find atomic uh, bomb victims and see how a really bad burn looks like. Here's a moderately bad burn. This one required skin grafting. This is from multiple fluoro procedures for at least a physiotherapist was doing some work. Here's what another really bad one looks like. This patient went on to amputation and a number of really bad skin grafts, so they can be bad. How do you avoid this? Well, a good way to start is to measure how much you're getting. How do we do that? Generally in units of gray or siever. You've probably heard of all of these. You've probably heard of rims and rentgens and other things like that. Let me simplify the world for you. One gray equals one sievert if we're talking about x-rays. So if you see gray, just convert it to sievert immediately. Now, before I launch any further, I want to put this in context. I think the best way to do this, how many of you have heard of x KCD, Internet Comic Strip. Well, Randall Monroe is a genius, a comic genius, but he also is, has some serious chops in science. And he came up in 2011 with this awesome uh, chart right here. I'm not going to go over every minute detail, but let me hit a few high points. This is the best document on the planet, in my opinion, for putting radiation exposure into context. For example, how many of you slept next to someone last night? There's your dose from that other person. How many people ate a banana that was out there in the front? There, there's your dose from eating that banana. An arm x-ray, there's about 10 bananas worth. Down at the bottom there's the amount of radiation you get every day, just being a living human. Now this whole blue panel here, which is your background, that collapses down to that tiny little box up here in the green, which is like three chest x-rays. Okay, you can see a mammogram down at the bottom, that's a bit more than a chest x-ray. And these two boxes over here in the lower left, that's how much the general public, uh, that's part of the threshold. Below that, they're good. Above that, we have to classify them as a radiation worker, and OSHA steps in on their rules and stuff like that. How much can you get as a radiation worker? You can get a lot more, like 50 times that much. That's the big green box on the side there. Okay, let's collapse all this green stuff down into a little box here. Let's start talking about harmful doses. All the green stuff was diagnostic. Here is harmful doses. So up there in the upper right, little red box, that's how much your limit is, 50 millisieverts per year. What do you suppose the threshold is for actual carcinogenesis? Unfortunately, not that much higher. So this idea of 50 millisieverts, uh, that's the US limit. I much prefer the European limit, which is about 20. Okay, let's look at some other levels of harm. So that's carcinogenesis. Here's radiation poisoning. Feel really bad for a long time. 
die some of the time, die most of the time, die all the time, much higher doses. So hopefully we will never achieve those doses in the OR or in radiology suite. Now this whole red box is gonna collapse down to one more box. This yellow box here is 10 minutes in Chernobyl. I think this is chart is brilliant because it sort of brings it back home. Think about clinic time when you've talked to a nervous mom or nervous dad or nervous physician who said, man, I don't know, do you really think we need the radiation dose of that arm x-ray? They equate Chernobyl with an arm film, but it's not. That's why I keep this chart on speed dial on my iPhone or my iPad, so I can pull it out and show my patients, show my residents. Okay, let's put this in context. This is probably less than you think it is. All right, having you know, the context, how much does a patient actually get? Like most important things in life, it depends. Here's one thing, it depends on the time. And we know that dose is proportional to time. So if you hold the pedal down for 10 minutes, it's gonna be twice the dose of five minutes. So don't do that if you don't have to. How many of you have seen this little screen here on PAX, which you've stored your floor images from surgery? This little panel up here has some useful information. Basically, that's how much the patient got for that procedure. If you look on here, the important numbers are this. 11 seconds of fluoro time, this is for this ORF of the ankle, and 0.6 milligray. Let's turn it, here's a procedure we did in radiology. Here's another factor, magnification. How many of you use magnification when you're doing fluoro? Magnification ups the dose. So use it with discretion. So remember that orthopedic procedure, 11 seconds and 0.4. Here's this radiology procedure. We just used seven seconds, but look, our dose is almost three times as much. What the heck did we do? <coughs> Answer is down here. We used mag for most of it, and that mag really upped the dose. We should not have done that. How many of you have heard the term pulsed fluoroscopy? Okay, you use it every day, but you're probably oblivious to it because the x-ray tech is standing back there uh, turning it on and off as need be. Here's what you need to know about that. If you leave the beam on constantly, that's this red bar up here. If you want to reduce the dose, a good way would be to turn the beam on and off many times per second. So right here you can see a quick way of getting half the dose. And if you change the pulse rate, you can get down to a quarter of the dose. Now, the, the upside is less radiation dose. What's the downside? Your images start to suck. So. If you notice your images are starting to suck, you might turn to the radiology tech and say, can we have some continuous, please? But then have them switch it back to pulse as soon as you can, because that will cut the dose down. Here you can see where that information is. Smaller parts get smaller dose. Here's a hand, 0.4 gray. Why is that? Well, in order to get an image you can actually tell something from, at least if you have a big body part, you have to pump a lot of radiation through it just to make it through and produce the image. So. A bigger part, such as this femur, we're up to 12. It's about 20 times the radiation. Hip, 15. Spine, 30. And you can look, count the number of pedicle screws here and figure, hmm, if we were doing, say, a whole lumbar or a whole thoracic spine, you can sort of do the math and figure out roughly how many milligrays that would be. It really adds up. So, enough about patients. Talk about the center of the universe, you. How much exposure did you get from all this? It depends. Uh, we don't know exactly, but we can estimate it from a dosimeter. So, you all have a dosimeter? Yes? Where do you wear it? Do you wear it outside the late apron or inside the late apron? Exactly, outside. Why is that? Well, because there's a lot of your body parts that aren't in this apron, like your arms, your head, your legs. We'd like to know what the worst case is for those parts. We know that inside the lead, it's gonna be a lot less. We wanna know what it's like outside. So how much do you get? Well, depends on things like this. Let's talk about distance. In your science training, you probably heard about the inverse square rule. Mathematically, it looks like this. Dose is, equal, is proportional to uh, the distance squared reciprocated. Here's a picture that shows that even better. Imagine this oval here is a patient on the table X-ray beam is, what you're seeing here, these little arrows are scatter radiation thrown off. That's the dose that you get. The, you're not in the main beam most of the time. You're getting the scatter from the patient. So if you stand right next to the table, you're getting most of that. If you stand back a, another meter or two, you get less. If you stand back a couple of meters, you get a lot less. Time, we talked about time. It's directly proportional. Cut the time in half, cut the dose in half. Shielding, 
Okay, you have the poll, we've seen how many of you use shielding, which is good. It cuts your dose down a lot, a huge amount, something like one or two orders of magnitude. So yay you for using shielding. How many of you know about the possibility of using the patient as a shield to shield your precious body from the radiation source? You should. Now, this drawing I showed you here is a little bit misleading. It suggests that this radiation field off the patient is fairly homogeneous, but it's really not. So check this out. Here's a patient on the table, main x-ray beam on. Here's what the scatter actually looks like. You can see there's less radiation on this side because the patient themselves are shielding uh, that side of the uh, room from uh, the radiation. So which side would you want to stand on if you were operating here? This side or that side? Yeah, probably this side, I agree. Okay, let's turn the CR up 90 degrees. Here we have the x-ray tube on top. You can see most of the radiation flux at this orientation is going up the guy's head and face and eyes and thyroid. This is not optimal. I prefer to have it down here. So, time for a pop quiz. Here is the little mini flora unit over at Roosevelt. So here's the C-arm. Which end of this has the x-ray source? Top or bottom? How many people vote for top? How many people vote for bottom? Okay, yeah, very good, it's the top. Interesting, you put the controls up there where it seems it would be so convenient to have them up top, but you, you should really flip that underneath if you wanna cut your dose down. Patient gets the same either way, but your dose will be a lot less if they are in the way of the beam. Okay, another pop quiz. Here's one of the bigger units, maybe like you're using in the OR. Which side is the uh, x-ray source, top or bottom? Bottom, excellent. So, what's the max dose you can safely get? Well, again, it depends. For US radiation workers, this number of 50 microsieverts is what's set. Europe, it's 20. I like the 20 number better myself. And that 20 unit is for your whole body, your thyroid, your gonads, your marrow. Uh, for eyes, eyes are a little less sensitive, you can get 150. For your hands, they're less sensitive, you can get 500. How does it work out for the eye? International Commission for Radiation Protection suggests that you can get five gray, five sieverts. That's a lot of radiation before your uh, lens starts to turn colors and get dark and becomes opaque. That's probably not correct. It's probably more like about one gray or one sievert. And let me show you a chilling, uh, couple of chilling statistics. You can actually get this kind of dose in a couple of years of routine clinical practice. If you're an interventional radiologist, if you're an orthopedic surgeon, and this is the most chilling of all. This is a survey of interventional radiologists. 8% already had cataracts. So, hmm, maybe they're the ones who aren't wearing the lead glasses. Think about it. The lead glasses actually work. They cut your dose down about 30-fold. That's huge. And when you get goggles, you don't want the little ones in front. You'd like to have them wrapping around the side because the x-rays get to your lens of your eye, not just from the front, but from any direction it wants. So if you're looking at the uh, monitor of the screen and the x-rays are over here, they're going to be right through your head unless you have some kind of screen there. So I'd do the wraparound kind would be optimal. Skin. How much skin dose can you get? Well, safely 500 millisieverts. What does that translate in terms of something we can see? Erythema dose, the sunburn from the beam. That's supposedly around two sieverts. So about four times as much. Anybody here seeing any redness on your skin after a lot of fluoro? I hope not. If you do, dude, you're using too much. Keep your hands out of the beam. Now, I know we have all put our hands in the beam. You, Ideally, you'd like to be outside the beam and do something, check and see where it is, but we all know that, man, if I just had my hand the beam there just for a second or two, I can get this over a lot quicker. We've all done that. But uh, it gives you a lot more dosage. So, throw a lot of numbers around here. What's the bottom line, which is basically, how many procedures can I do a year safely? Let's look at worst case. Suppose you decide to be a cowboy. You're not gonna wear any protection, no lead apron, no goggles, nothing. Probably you might be able to do 250 procedures a year. And if you have 100 clinic days and you're operating 250, that's one procedure a day. That's not as much as you hoped for, possibly. If you use protection like that lead apron, the thyroid shield, the goggles, probably 10 times that much. Does this sound like a reasonable number that you guys do a year? You're doing more? 
your mileage may vary. Now, what about somebody else in the room, like one of your minions standing about two meters away, using the inverse square law, they're probably not even getting as much radiation uh, enough to qualify as a radiation worker. So still though, they want to stay out of the main beam. They want to stay as far away as they can. But the further away you are from the actual furrow machine, the better you are. I want to wrap up here with talking about the pregnant orthopedist because there will be women radiologists, there will be women orthopedists, there will be pregnant radiologists, pregnant uh, orthopedic surgeons. What about that? First, the bad news. These are some of the terrible things that occur to a fetus due to radiation. They're all horrible. The good news is it takes a lot of radiation to do that, quite a bit. Now, if you were going to, if you're feeling nervous and wanted to avoid uh, most of the risk, then stay out of the OR for the first trimester, possibly the second, depending on how you feel. The third trimester, you should be good. And if, if you want to judge by the number of female radiology residents who are pregnant and doing fluoro, there are a number of them. So that they feel pretty safe about it. Generally, if you're under this 50 microsievert or millisievert limit, uh, the chances are really, really minimal of injuring a fetus. If you'd like to know more about this, there's this wonderful article written by two female interventional radiologists called Pregnancy and the Working Interventionalist. And it's got a lot of great stuff. Here on this chart, you can see this is your 50 on the side right here. How much do you get if you put on one laid apron? The fetal dose will be right there under single lead dose, about 0.9, which is not much. If you wear double lead, like some of our residents do, then it drops it down considerably more, which is down into the probably negligible range. So the answer, can I work safely when I'm pregnant? Yeah, uh, we think you can as best as we can tell. So in conclusion, you've heard this word, Alara. That's a big name in radiation safety, as little as reasonably achievable. What that means is some days you need more radiation. You just do. The patient body habitus, uh, the orientation, uh, maybe the procedure runs longer. You're, you're in command, but try to use as little as you can get away with. And remember, if you decrease your patient's dose, you'll decrease your own dose, so that's a good thing. I'll pause now for a wild applause. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Richardson, for making me look terrible for following up. Um, so that was great. Um, I'm, so my name is John Lynch. I'm an infectious disease doctor at Harborview, and I run the uh, infection prevention program there as well as the employee health program. So I do a fair amount of occupational health, and I've been asked to talk about bloodborne pathogens. One thing I just want to note, uh, following up on the, both the previous talks, is that for especially for the residents and trainees in the room. One thing to think about uh, with radiation, with all these occupational exposures, is that you're just at the beginning of your careers and you have decades more to go. Uh, and really thinking about the risks you take now and how those sort of will continue over the course of your career. And really when we're talking about radiation safety and the occupational stuff, bloodborne pathogens I'm gonna talk about, you know, the idea is there's lots of things we can do to prevent harm so that you can have a rich, fulfilling, happy career with minimal risk. So just sort of think about that. What's happening right today really does have an impact on the, how your future will unfold. So bloodborne pathogens. The big ones we talk about always are human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus. And those are the ones I'm going to focus on today around bloodborne pathogen exposures. It's the ones we talk about a lot, the ones you guys think about a lot. There are others. You know, you can get syphilis. You can get malaria. You can get other things from bloodborne pathogens uh, exposures. But uh, these are really the, the big topics. So I thought it'd be very useful to actually go over some data, some real life data. One caveat to the data I will show you is that um, physicians, as kind of alluded to by Dr. Richardson, are terrible reporters. As a group, we don't report things to employee health. Um, and that's a big problem because we actually don't know what the true scope of the problem is. Um, and in particular, uh, Bloodborne exposures, needle sticks especially, uh, needle sticks by surgeons especially, especially, don't get reported, right? And I'll come back to that. So here's the data we have based on what we know. Um, I don't have national data because there's no national database for things like bloodborne exposures. So this is just Harborview's data and what we collect. Uh, 
So this is just looking at all bloodborne exposures, that's the BBE by type of exposure and explicitly at Harborview. Um, and so you can see suture needles, wires and pins, the SSEPs, that's you know, for, uh, uh, for neuro folks, instruments, sorted sharps, blades and other needles. So you can see right down suture needles being overwhelming and this is pretty standard over time, so 2012, 2015 with wires and pins behind that. Who's using wires and pins? All of you guys, right? Pretty much all in the orthopods. Um, there in second. So if you suture needles, wires, and pins, two biggest risk groups at Harborview. This is probably consistent in any site uh, like that. If we look at the needles themselves, um, you can see here just again trends over time. Intravascular needles, kind of maybe a slight trend down at Harborview. And then if you look at solid needles and injection needles, there's actually been a trend upwards. So things haven't gotten necessarily better in terms of reporting. Now, some of this may be just better reporting since 2011. We use the PSN system. Has everyone heard of PSN? Has anybody not heard of PSN? Okay, thank you, that's fantastic. So for the one person over there, um, it's our electronic uh, reporting tool. It's, used, it's a patient safety network, so it's really not originally designed around patient harm, but there's a drop box there for employees. And we review all those cases really uh, closely. If you guys get a bloodborne exposure to Harborview and you report it to employee health, and you don't put a PSN in, we do it for you because we really want to track these things with meaningful metrics. So, um, so one caveat, you know, so pu put a PSN in. And you don't have to put much in, just put your name and something, and it just helps us keep track of things. But you can see there's been a general trend upwards. So this isn't something that's going away. Here's looking at, this is a little busy slide, but it's BBE by location and job, and job classification. So just looking at the site's acute care with OR being here in the middle, uh, in this green bar being physician trainees, right? Students are this small red one here and attending physicians are the dark blue. So the two leading groups there, which I'll, I'll split out here a little bit more uh, closely in the next slide, but the OR being the most concerning situation for uh, these exposures. And here's just looking at uh, job classification in general. So we know what's happening in the OR. Physician trainees, I think that's the majority of people in the audience, yeah? are leading the way year after year after year in terms of these exposures. So the folks in the room who are in training are the ones who are at the highest risk for bloodborne exposures at probably most hospitals, and I definitely know that at Harborview. Um, and I showed you what they are. They're happening with, um, in the OR, and they're happening with the wires, and they're happening with the needles. So we're kind of focusing this group down, right, tighter and tighter into the people in this room. So here's a little, uh, this is a little busy slide again, but it's, this is looking at all the years from 2010 to 2015, uh, and then split out by month, because there's always been this sort of idea that, oh, when you first come into residency is, you know, it's the inter new interns, any new interns here? No, you don't have new interns, they're all working, I guess, right? <laughs> you know, that it's, it's, that's the group that's at the highest risk. Um, and, you know, there may be a slight trend up. It's hard to say with all the kind of noise here, but you can see years where the highest numbers are in October or in February. Um, so maybe a little bit of a bump during the summer, but that's also at Harborview is a really busy time with lots of trauma and lots of OR time uh, and so lots of exposure. So it's really hard to sort of parse out. So the important takeaway from this is there's maybe not a really strong trend associated with just entering into residency. Um, it's a risk that's distributed across the entire year, year after year after year, focused on people using wires, needles, and in training. Am I getting the point here? Yeah? So let's talk about the source patient pathology. So again, this is the Harborview population. Uh, of the around 100 plus uh, uh, needles, or excuse me, bloodborne exposures per year, we have, uh, this is just from last year, 2015, looking at the 70 who actually had source pathology. So when someone reports uh, needle stick or some other bloodborne exposure, we go ahead and do the testing of that patient. Just to be sure, so you guys know, to minimize barriers. It used to be you have to get all the consents and get all the blood work. We do that for you. We try to make that as easy as possible. For all you have to do is report it, we take care of the rest. If you find any barriers to that, please let the employee health folks know. We're happy to make it a better service so that you can be taken care of in a safe and efficient way. But, and this is why, we have lots of source patient pathology. So about 20% of the 70 uh, had, uh, were HIV positive. Hepatitis B service antigen positive, so hepatitis B infected were just under 5%. And then a large proportion of hep C antibody positive. 
So that's a little disconcerting, right? Because you get these numbers back and you say, oh, they have, they've had least hep C, they may have had, they have hep B, they have HIV, what have you. Uh, of the hep C positive folks, most of those folks are, <coughs> are PCR positive, so are actually infected. Not, and then uh, the rest of the group are exposed and have cleared it, either because they naturally cleared it or they um, uh, have been treated for it. So when we go back to this group, you know, it's a fair number of folks out there at a place like a county hospital like Harborview that actually have a, an infectious disease that can potentially be transmitted by one of these bloodborne exposures. So I'm going to just uh, go through this a little bit more slowly. So when you get exposed, I just mentioned that we know that these numbers are underreporting, right? Um, physicians just don't do this. They don't stop what they're doing and, and report what's going on. We do the work, so we'll do the consenting, we'll do the tracking, we'll the ones who'll call you to make sure you come back for your follow-up appointment, you know, we'll get the prescriptions in. And when that employee health is not open, you know, we're open from basically 8 to 4.30 or 5, Monday through Friday, the ED is open. And we have all, at Harborview and at UWMC, we, and I'm sure this is at the VA as well, have a robust process for doing the same exact thing with tracking um, throughout the, the 24 hour cycle. So it shouldn't get in the way no matter what time or day. And the key thing when you get a bloodborne exposure is actually timeliness to starting antiretrovirals is probably the key thing uh, if you do have an, a HIV positive exposure. And we know that the closer you get to that exposure, the more effective the ART is. You know, we have this window of 24 hours of high, expect, of high effectiveness, but the closer you get, an hour, two hours, three hours, also has an impact on the risk of absolute transmission. Um, so what do we do around HIV? We do uh, you know, basically an exposure assessment. So was, what kind of exposure was it? What was the patient's you know, viral status? We do all that testing. And if the risk is high enough, just regardless while we're waiting for the test, we'll get that, at least that first dose of antiretroviral therapy in. Now, one of the things that really got in the way of this historically was the tolerability of antiretroviral therapy. It used to be very uh, unhappy, you know, not a great drug to take, make a lot of people nauseated. The completion rate for a full 28 days with a true exposure was actually probably less than half of folks. So if you had a known HIV infected person with a good exposure, the, still the proportion of people finishing the antiretroviral therapy for 28 days was a minority. Just because it was so, you know, made you sick to your stomach, it just made you feel poorly while you had to continue working. That's changed a lot. So the antiretroviral therapy we have now is actually much more tolerable. It has minimal side effects uh, and it has the same level of effectiveness. So you can start antiretroviral therapy, not necessarily feel ill, uh, probably not, probably feel just fine and be able to finish a 28 day course if necessary. But what we really want to do is get that first dose in while we're waiting for the test to come back, especially in high risk situations, because that can have a profound impact on your risk. Um, hepatitis B, so everyone in the room should be hepatitis B vaccinated. This is incredibly effective. We should be titering you um, to make sure that, that that hepatitis B vaccine took. So there's a minority of folks whose hepatitis B vaccines don't generate the titer they need. It may need a second round, and we can certainly do that for you in employee health. So you haven't been titered, come on down to employee health and we'll get that titer for you to make sure that you're fully protected. Obviously we test you should you be exposed for uh, hepatitis B and your level of immunity. But that's a sterilizing vaccine uh, and it works great. So that's something to be completely prevented. So, but I showed you the big group of these exposures with a known pathogen is hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is the number one cause for liver disease and cirrhosis in the United States, incredibly common. Um, there's a lot of occult hepatitis C out there. So folks who had no idea they have hepatitis C. Um, and uh, you know, we go back five years ago, four years ago, um, it was, a, much bigger deal than it is now. And the big transition is really an amazing revolution in the treatment of hepatitis C. We've gone from a fairly toxic regimen that made people feel terrible for six plus months, kind of feeling like they had the flu constantly, had a lot of side effects associated with it, um, to having now a, you know, one pill a day for six to 12 weeks and with an effectiveness of 90 plus percent. So uh, we've had hepatitis C infected surgeons in, at Harborview. Uh, who have uh, been cured completely. Uh, and that's with a fairly tolerable regimen with incredibly high effectiveness. So although we have great treatments for it, um, we don't use it as prophylaxis because the transmission rate continues to be extremely low. So even taking the drug uh, isn't, you know, ahead of time doesn't really make sense in the way we do for HIV. Um, part of that is that the cost of the drug is extremely high. So interretrovirals, we obviously 
we provide those as, as needed. Um, that's a, a, a disease once you get infected can't go away, right? So it's just about treating it and preventing it. Hepatitis C is a drug, is a disease we can definitely treat. Uh, I don't know what the most recent cost, but it's around, you know, $50,000 for treatment course. So we tend not to just do that employee health, you know. Um, but it's uh, something we test for. So those are the three big uh, pathogens we test for. Obviously, if the patient has other things going on, we would uh, do more testing. And then we do follow-up. So we do testing of you, we do testing of the patients, and then we, if the exposure's there, we'll do subsequent uh, testing. And we will email you and contact you to make sure that you know the schedule. It's not up to you to have to remember it. Uh, we really try to, again, make it super easy. So one of the uh, newer things is around what happens with infection. So in the old days, uh, for some folks in the, in the audience will remember this, if you had HIV infection, hepatitis B infection, hepatitis C infection, you no longer operated, right? This is a huge deal for the folks in this room, right? If you were a surgeon and you got this infection, your career was over as you had envisioned it. Big deal. And I know surgeons who actually to this day don't, have never returned to the operating room uh, because of that. Um, so that's not the way things are anymore, right? And this is an important takeaway from all this. Um, the current status is that there's a UW Medicine uh, Advisory Committee on blood burn Pathogens. There are sort of standards in the country around this, um, but they're not firm. There's no real law around it. The only law that's out there sort of st states that if you know you're infected, you have to take appropriate precautions, right, to prevent transmission. Um, but so we have a UW Medicine Advisory Committee here at Harvard uh, in the UW Medicine uh, system. Uh, Patch Dellinger from General Surgery is the chair, and there's a, a number of us on it. And this uh, advisory committee is the group that sort of evaluates the risks of uh, benefit of all this. But what we use for that is this update from 2010 from a group called the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. Um, and this is actually in process of being updated right now. So again, I told you the old days, infection, no operating, right? This is the first uh, attempt at sort of applying a risk assessment. Um, and the way they did it, and it kind of made sense, is to look at the viral load. So GE is genome equivalent, so it's basically the viral load. So you can look at hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. And if you look at um, the categories, one, two, and three, probably the most important thing to recognize here is category three are pretty much all of the surgeries that you guys do, right? Those are the, what they would put in the highest risk category. Um, uh, Category two included in there is th are the only thing that you guys folks, folks would be doing are really like amputations. For some reason, they put that in the category two. In the category one of the lowest risk uh, sort of procedures, like dental scaling. They put a lot of dental stuff in here. As you probably remember, there's a lot of transmissions or some transmissions from uh, in the dental world. So if we think about category uh, three, that if your hepatitis B viral load, your hepatitis C viral load, or your HIV viral load is low, right, not undetectable, but low, there's no restrictions on performing surgeries. So that's, this is a big take, this is a really big takeaway. It's really important that having these infections does not mean that you cannot be a surgeon. It does not mean that you cannot do what you do today uh, should you become infected. So that's, a, that's really, really important. Now, <clears throat> these aren't perfect numbers, you know, less than 10 to the fourth is, you know, pretty low. Hepatitis B, less than 10 to the fourth, those are pretty low numbers. You know, a treated, a person with HIV who's treated, you know, we expect this to be zero, basically undetectable. So even having a few hundred copies, um, you know, it doesn't really make much sense. Um, and you really only see that res the restrictions come in these category threes with really uncontrolled viral loads in any of these things. So again, what I told you though, is that, you know, hepatitis B, not only are there, you should all be vaccinated and really almost no risk for getting infected. There are treatments for that that are effective. Hepatitis C, we have extremely effective treatments. So if you have uncontrolled viral load there, you may take a short hiatus, get treated, as we just uh, did recently with a surgeon uh, at Harborview, and uh, had a good successful outcome. And HIV, you'd have to be pretty much uncontrolled, untreated HIV infection in order to not, in order to, you know, the recommendation not to be uh, operating on uh, doing whatever procedure. So the key point though is your infection, your infection status doesn't mean that you can't be a surgeon, which is, again, very different than it was in the past. So prevention, I think I'm going to, I think this will be closing on this part, oops, is, again, I start off with reporting. I don't actually know what's happening unless you tell me what's happening. Um, 
uh, my job is to keep your environment as safe as possible. So you have to tell me what we can do to make it safer. And so one of the key things there is understanding how often it's happening. So if I know how often it's happening, I can define the scope of the issue. I can bring resources to it. I can determine if interventions work. So if I put some new thing in place and the rates don't change, well, that's just because the number of people who are reporting may not be an honest uh, number. Um, and then we can think about effective treatment for folks who report. If you don't report, you don't come to employee health, you don't go to the ED, there's nothing I can do to minimize your risk. So that's my goal, is to minimize your risk uh, of these exposures. Um, education, so uh, this is for everyone in the room. Uh, OSHA, as reported uh, by uh, Dr. Domes there earlier, is the authoritative legislative body or authoritative regulatory body around occupational health. Uh, they require all people at risk for bloodborne exposure to have annual training. Have any of you guys gotten annual training? You have some? You some? How about the attendings? You got annual training on bloodborne exposures? What's that? Children's in here, so we actually never, we've never had one here at the UW system. That's great that Children's does it, but we're actually got a new one, uh, and we're gonna make it required for all physicians. Uh, it's only seven minutes. It's super easy, there's almost no test. You guys used to have to test out, that's what it was. You know how many of you passed the test? Like 30%. So we made it easier. Um, <laughs> the, with a question being, where do you go at one o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning after you get stuck? Right? That's, I'm telling you the answer right now. Where do you go? ER, ER right? That's the question. Because I want you, again, the, I don't need you to memorize like, the pathology associated with HIV infection. That's not the point. The point is please go and get evaluated so that we can take care of you. Um, and that's the most important sort of takeaway from that. So there will be a seven minute module that everyone in the room has to do. Um, and then equipment. You know, I know that people talk about blunt needles and all that sort of stuff and, and you know, Again, I don't know what equipment you need unless you tell me, and I can, again, advocate for that type of equipment. Probably, and also associated with equipment, is procedures. How are things handled in the OR? Um, you know, how are sharps handled? How are needles handled? How are they passed and moved? Are all need to be, you know, come from the experts, so the users out there, so that we can uh, advocate for those things and get them into your, uh, into your ORs. And then I just put this up here because there's been obviously a lot of discussion around sleep and fatigue, in, uh, especially in trainees, but this applies to attendings as well. There is no literature out there <clears throat> on the effect of sleep and fatigue on bloodborne exposures. And I'm, especially, you know, I'm actually amazed that this hasn't been done, probably should be done. I don't know how the study would be uh, performed. Um, but we know that sleep and fatigue have a profound impact on cognitive you know, uh, activities and mechanical activities. We know that uh, internal medicine, there's a study out there looking at sleep and fatigue in internal medicine residents and the risk of uh, car accidents subsequent, and that makes no, it's not like very difficult to imagine that. So you can think about standing there and being ex at these high risk uh, situations and whether that has an impact. And um, yes, no, yeah. So we should definitely be thinking about how th these things have an impact. There's no data I can show you, there's nothing I can tell you explicitly, but when you're in a tired state, I virtually guarantee you it's not gonna take a paper to prove that you're at high risk. So taking, you know, whether we need to approach that, think about that differently, making sure the attending and the resident in the room, you know, recognize, hey, rough night last night, let's stop, slow down, let's think about what we're gonna do with our sharps um, so that we protect each other and other folks in the field. That's my last slide. I think we're gonna come up and take questions now. So thanks for your attention, and I hope, look forward to seeing you at Harborview. Uh, so we've, we've kind of uh, hit our maximum time allotment, but we will take questions uh, for a couple minutes if, if sure. we have time. Um, so thank you, everybody. Uh, hopefully this was educational and you got something out of it and uh, stemmed some or spurred some questions, and we're happy to take questions if you guys want to come up and ask us. Or, or, A skin splatter to intact skin? Yeah. Almost zero. Uh, that's I'm sorry? That's much more likely in my experience. Yeah, yeah, so just to, so the folks on the video who are asking, the, the question was around uh, risk of a bloodborne transmission to intact skin, and it's virtually zero. Our skin is amazingly good at preventing all those things. So we don't actually prophylax folks with that situation. 
I very, very rare. There are case reports of, of exposures directly to the conjunctiva. Um, there's, I think there's one for uh, hepatitis C. We don't actually prophylax for HIV and eye splashes. So it's almost zero. I just want to say that I thought both lectures were great and they should be videoed and so that you can have a little um, exposure for and pass those around to the residents in uh, the future. I think it's great. As far as the radiation is concerned, I think there are many, many questions. And I just, we have a paper that's going into spine this uh, right away. And it's, it's about the thyroid risk. And really, it was, depending on how, how you analyze it, it's almost 20 times as high 40 years later for thyroid cancer. And uh, these were surgeons who, who have been through early times when they didn't, they didn't protect themselves so much. So it looks to be a fourth decade problem, fourth decade of surgery. So it does take a long time to get that accumulative dose up there. Uh, and I think that uh, we really need to uh, respond to that. And my one question is, Harborview uses lateral x-ray, lateral C-arms to put in pedicle screws versus the more common way, which is um, anterior, posterior C-arm. And I wanted to know the difference in the exposure. Good question. That's probably something I should turn to one of our physicists. Uh, I want to go. Certainly. Uh, he, he turned it on. I should be, have my own private unit here. Good question. Certainly, uh, you're talking about dose to the surgeon, I presume. The patient will get the same dose no matter where they are. Um, I guess the main thing you could do would be to be on the uh, image intensifier side of the equipment, if you can somehow arrange that. Uh, as to how much dose you're actually getting, good question. Hopefully the dosimeter will shed some light on that. Okay, so we're uh, out of time, but if you have questions, please come up there and uh, we'll have a couple of minutes. So thank you.